Oh, good morning. Uh, Neil keeps saying I'm going to tell bad stories, and I'll tell a few bad stories, but I'm, you know, I am an optimist at heart, and I want to at least give you a happy ending uh, to this conversation. Uh, let me start with a couple of stories uh, of things that we have seen uh, around the world. Uh, in Indonesia, I was visiting an IDP camp, and uh, the man, a man came up to me and he said, you know, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Um, I was there working with an NGO. I was not part of the NGO, but he was thanking me anyway. Uh, so thank you very much for everything that you've, you've given us. Now when are you going to bring us the guns so we can go back to our village? And I said, well, that's not really who we are. That's you know, not necessarily what we as NGOs do. And he said, I thought we were all Christians together. That NGO was an explicitly Christian NGO. In many parts of Indonesia, they worked primarily with Muslims. In that particular region, they were focusing their concentration of their assistance on Christians who were at greater risk <clears throat> and had greater needs than the Muslim population. But in that area, people saw that as a solidarity issue. Christians working with Christians, and eventually we'll be able to take our land back because we're supported by this Christian NGO. So both people in the IDP camp saw that NGO as supporting them. People outside that IDP camp, the Muslims in the community, saw that NGO as hostile as well. <clears throat> that could lead to some problems. And the NGO, I will, you know, happy ending, realized it <laughs> after that conversation I had with that gentleman. <clears throat> in Afghanistan, uh, an NGO was asked by the government, working with the government, the government ministry, was asked to set up health services in a district. And they were asked to use a particular village as the focal point for that uh, because of its geographical centrality. They got there, and as they were traveling back and forth around the district and figuring out what they needed to put in place, that the village where they'd been asked to set up was the only Tajik village in an area surrounded by Hazara and Pashtun villages. They realized, in that case, that setting up that as the central area was actually going to lead to violence. That their clinic would not be able to function, their people wouldn't be able to travel out, and that village would likely be attacked by their neighbors. <laughs> and in Sudan, it's the last story I'll tell for a moment. In Sudan, uh, an NGO was working to set up a clinic in a particular area where there was a militia group that controlled the area, that militia group had a disagreement and split into two groups. In order to maintain access to the populations there, that NGO then created two clinics, putting one on each side of that. Uh, and reflecting shortly thereafter, they realized they had rewarded the split, that they had rewarded the violence in that situation. In each of these cases, and I'll come back to this, people realized that what they were doing and how they were interacting with the people in that situation was leading to violence or potentially to increased violence. And they came up with some strategies uh, for how to mitigate that. And I'll tell you some of that a little bit later. Uh, as Neil mentioned, you know, there are, of course, uh, these folks, uh, Karadzic and Mengele, who are medical professionals who are also evil. That's not what the Do No Harm Project has looked at. Uh, what we have been looking at is people with good intentions, often doing really good work, who nonetheless find themselves contributing to the perpetuation or the increase of violence in a situation. In each of these three stories that I've told you, these NGOs not only had good intentions, which as we know are not enough, they actually were doing effective work with many of the people they were interacting with. But the larger environment, the larger community, the larger society in which they were working, they were actually uh, helping to lead down a bad path. The Do No Harm Project uh, for the past 16 years has been collecting these stories of the ways in which uh, NGO workers of all sorts, of development and humanitarian, but also, I would emphasize, both local and international, and then the UN and donors uh, as well. The way in which those interactions in conflict situations uh, can lead to increases in violence. Uh, and the good news is we've also been watching how people have mitigated violence through their interventions as well. So it's not only bad news. 
2,400 years ago, Hippocrates established do no harm as that first principle of medical ethics. Uh, and it didn't, as this project, the do no harm project started, we were called the local capacities for peace project. Uh, very early on, a doctor at, at a workshop session with us said, local capacities for peace is fine, but what you're really doing is establishing a first principle for humanitarian action. You're establishing a do no harm for humanitarians. Uh, and Mary Anderson took that name and decided that that was actually, that he was right and that was appropriate to take that principle. That principle of do no harm and principles in general, those are the bedrock, the base upon which we should be uh, doing our work, thinking about what we do and why we do it and how we do it. Uh, the Red Cross, as you know, has its seven principles uh, upon which all of their work is based, both the reason for doing it and then the how, the mechanism for going into the field to do it. But as I've mentioned with those stories, and as we've all seen from our experience, things go wrong. And what we've seen through the Do No Harm Project is things tend to go wrong when we are getting away from our principles. Things go wrong in both what we do and in how we do it. And when we're not acting in line with our principles, whatever those principles are, we have a tendency to stray off of these things. It is not easy to turn our principles into practice. If it were easy to turn our principles into practice, we'd all be doing it. We'd all be doing it on a regular basis. Uh, the challenge there is how do we take those principles, these abstract ideas, what does the principle of humanity mean <laughs> if we operationalize it? What does the principle of neutrality mean if we operationalize it? Uh, one of the nice things about the Red Cross is they have done a huge amount of work and thought <laughs> on that. And we can follow some of their techniques. What does it mean to operationalize do no harm as a principle? For the past three years in the Do No Harm Project, we've actually been looking at what that means. We've been visiting with people who've been a part of the project uh, over the past 16 years and figuring out what it is that they do. And when they say that they've been successful, what does that mean? When they say that they have not been successful, what does that mean? And we have come up with uh, some interesting uh, findings out of what people do when they, they say they operationalize it.